Hope. Are you for it or against it? The word has a bad rap. Wishy-washy, dream don't do. When it was a slogan of the Obama administration, it felt like a bit of a confidence trick. Hoping led a lot of activists to sort of de-escalate their work for change. But our guest says hope is also a means of survival and strategy while thinking creatively about how to take power. I'm joined by activist and author D. Ray McKesson, who makes the case for hope and imagination's role in his new book, On the Other Side of Freedom. McKesson's an activist from Baltimore, Maryland, whose work during the Ferguson uprising gave him, a, gave him a national profile, also spurred him to run for mayor, a bid he lost and for which he received a certain amount of grief. He is now the executive producer of Pod Save the People, one of my favorites. It's a podcast exploring social issues through commentary and conversation. Welcome to the show, Derek. Glad it's to have you. Good to be here. So, 2014, Ferguson... What's happened? What's changed since? What's changed with you? What's changed with the movement, media? Yeah, think about you think about 2014 is that people thought there was a problem in Ferguson. They didn't think there was a problem in America. And now people realize that this issue of police violence and criminal justice has to be a nationwide conversation. Yeah. You know, when we were in the street, if you ever saw us marching, we were in the street for 400 days, you know? You forget that. Yeah, people, people think about it as like a long weekend. It was like a long 400 days. And, you know, it was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October of 2014. So if you ever saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was that we had to. You know, we didn't get it declared unconstitutional until October, which is sort of wild. So I think that what has changed is that the, co the, the awareness is different, that now there's a nationwide conversation. The press is pushing back on the police in ways that they weren't before, and we know way more about policing than we did then. And media's changed. I mean, at that time, we were finding what was happening from your Twitter feed and other yeah, people's. Yeah, and even the reporters. You know, there'd be press conferences with the police, and the, and the reporters would ask these softball questions. There'd be inconsistencies in the police narrative, and the reporters would be like, oh, well, the police said it. And now, like, you just see aggressive reporting in a way that is really powerful because we don't have to be the only people sort of picking it apart now. Now, how have you changed? I mean, I was struck by the subtitle of your book. Well, the subtitle of the book, The, the Case for Hope, is trying to be really clear that, you know, when we say the system is broken and people say, oh, no, it was designed to be like this, my takeaway from that is that it was designed, mm -hmm. right? People made this up. And because people made it up, we can make something different. So when I think about hope, hope is a belief that our tomorrows can be better than our today's. When King says the, the more arc been towards justice, that's a statement about faith, belief in things unseen. Uh, when we think about hope, hope says the arc can bend because people bend it. Yeah, you don't and just like, sit around and wait for it to bend. At least yeah, that's my approach. Yeah, and like hope is hope is work. Hope's not magic, right? So when I think about like why are all these people in the street, why are people running for office, why are people at board meetings and all this other stuff, it's because they know that this version of the world that we're in right now is not the best version that it can be. All right, so that's the case for hope. Imagination has the, is the part about the other side of justice imagining some, something we haven't actually seen? Yeah, so you can't fight for what you can't imagine, right? That part of this is understanding that freedom is not only the absence of oppression, but the presence of justice and joy. So we can get rid of all the bad things, but getting rid of all the bad things doesn't mean that the good things suddenly come in. We gotta make the good things. So we can free everybody from prison. That isn't the presence of justice in and of itself. We have to build a justice system that is like real and true and honest and doesn't damage people. So the imagination part is really, is really key. And let's talk a bit about the work, because I was very struck, and both on, on Pod Saves the People and in some of the interviews in Pod Saves the People, so both in your commentaries and in the interviews, you often talk about the importance of addressing structural challenges that are not so very sexy, um, and maybe we don't talk about enough. And not so long ago, I, th I give you credit for her victory in the primary, you interviewed uh, Letitia James, uh, the public advocate of yeah. New York, who, who just won the primary to, to run for attorney general. Let's talk about the work that isn't sexy, because she talked about it. She said, you know, you asked, like, what does the public advocate does? Well, they do this, that, this, that, and that that you've never heard of. What does the attorney general do? Kind of the same, except for a few yeah. high-profile things. Um, our media doesn't help, I don't think, in talking about what it takes to actually make change. No, I agree. So we think I spend more time around the police than, than anything else. And like you think about in California, there's a law in California that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline right. regardless of the outcome. Right. That's wild, right? That is a huge lever to change. But it just isn't really sexy. Like in Cleveland, they destroy police officer disciplinary records every two years. That is wild. 
but like it's not necessarily a sexy that is probably sexier than some other policy stuff but like still it doesn't ever break through so i'm shocked too what we found is that a lot of reporters are still nervous about attacking some of the system stuff they're nervous about writing about police unions and nervous about writing some of these things that seem really wonky but they have a huge impact on people's lives and what she said was i could take on this question of the police secrecy laws yeah. and the secrecy around the records of individual police Which is great. officers that could make a real change. It could be huge, yeah, and like they could be a leader here. You know, in that episode, we also talked about some legislation that other places have put into into place to make sure that there are independent investigations, to make sure that uh, municipalities don't get to create rules that like do all these weird and wacky things. So I'm hopeful about her. Uh, you know, and what was interesting about the conversation with Tish James is that she's like publicly walking into the issues with the police. Most people are like. And very quietly being like, okay, we support you on the police. Right. But she's sort of like, this is an issue. And it's like, thank you, this is an issue. And a third of all the people killed in this country by a stranger is actually killed by a police officer. That is wild. You talked about the statistics in, in California in, in the book. I mean, the, the chapter on policing in the book is deep. Yeah, one in 11 gun homicides in California is committed by an officer. So how do we build movement? I mean, one of the criticisms that you got when you ran for mayor was he hasn't done the street work. He doesn't have the credibility. He hasn't got, he's got the followers, but he doesn't have the followers in the street or the, the track record. Um, how do we build movement that also generates leaders uh, without kind of cannibalizing our leaders, which is something we often do as soon as they get the head over the parapet. Yeah, I think about, you know, when I ran for mayor in Baltimore, it's this interesting thing because it wasn't necessarily not having the street credit. It was a lot of people saying, you didn't do it with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd open up an after-school center in Baltimore. I trained and supported a third of all the new teachers in the city, worked in the office of human capital. So I'd done work, more work than a lot of people, but they were like, well, I didn't see you. It's like, well, you were in middle school when I opened up the after-school center. That's why I didn't see you. Mm. But there is this question, what is true is that when I ran for mayor, there was this idea that being a part of the system was selling out. That like, if you choose to be a part of it, then like you actually aren't really fighting. It's just about you. In the advent of Trump, you see the exact opposite now. It's like, if you don't run for office, you don't care, right? Everybody's running for office. You probably donated 10 million campaigns. I've donated 10 million campaigns. I've supported all these people. That like, there's a sea change that has happened all of a sudden because people realize we can't just be yelling at the people in power. We have to be the people in power. And we have to keep at it. I mean, is that why you wear the vest? To, to remember that this is a long-term project? Yeah, and I, you know, I've been wearing this specific vest since the protests, and uh, I never want to forget what happened, right? That was just not too long ago. I never want to forget what it was like to be dragged out of a police department by my ankles. I never want to forget what it was like to be tear gas and pepper spray because that was real. And it reminds me that freedom is fragile. And like, I never want to get, no matter what room I'm in, I never want to be deluded to think, oh no, we got this. This is like, because reality is for all of the awareness that has happened over the last four years, the outcomes are still bad, right? The police are still killing as many people as they used to kill despite the despite all of the media awareness. So people do lose hope. I mean, they, they lose that, exactly that quality of belief that something could really be different and then they give up voting or they give up getting active. I think that people's faith is being challenged. I think that the certainty or the, the sense that it is coming I think is what's challenged. I think that people's hope is actually why you still see people running for office. It's why you still see people going out into the street. It's why you see people at the conferences. Like, it, like that is hope to me. That's the work of hope. That's all hope work happening. Mm -hmm. But it's very different from faith. Yeah, faith is, again, if King, when King says the arc bends, he's like, it just bends towards justice. Mm -hmm. I think that people are challenging that at this moment. They're like, we don't know if it just bends. I think that what we're saying is that it bends because people bend it. And I think that people understand that now. So when you say we nowadays, who does that we refer to? The we is a lot of people. <laughs> but I often, you know, I'm always reminded that I'm one of many people who stood in the street. So when I talk about the we in, in that sense, it's, you know, everybody, I think, fighting for justice. When I say we created these projects around police union contracts or uh, use of force policies, it's me, Brittany Packnett, and Samuel Sinyangwe, who I've been with for a long time. We've kept the team pretty small because we want to be as nimble as possible in the work. You're learning a lot during that podcast. You're enjoying it? I, so what I love about the podcast is that I'm learning too, right? That it's not me just like saying all these random things. It's, it's me, Brittany uh, Packnett, um, Samuel Sinyangwe, and Clint Smith III, who like everybody brings their own perspective. And like, you know, we just recorded the other day and everybody's news. I was like, that was great, didn't know that, that was great. This is amazing, so I appreciate that. Some people are saying, oh, this is the new, you know, alternative to the right-wing media network. Is it as simple as that? Yeah, you know, what we find is that people are hungry for good content, right? And I was the third podcast on the network. I've been around since since uh, Crooked started uh, and you, 
you know, last year we were one of the most download, top 20 downloaded in the country, won two Webbies for Best News and People's Choice for Best News. So proud of the podcast. People listen to it. And, you know, with Pod Save America, they follow the day-to-day news sort of that's happening with Trump. And we follow all the news you don't know but should, right? Um, and then there are a host of other podcasts that have spawned in the network, too, trying to cover all of the different pockets of people in the country who want to be informed. You know, I spend more time on Twitter than anywhere else. And what I've realized is that, like, it's just not a great platform for telling full stories. I can tell bite-sized things. I can tell quick messages. But, like, how to tell a full story, you just can't do it there. So in the book, it's the first time I write about my mother leaving and what that meant. Uh, I write about being gay for the first time in the book. I've been out for as long as I can remember, but I write about it for the first time. So those are important to me because we show up as our full selves in all the rooms that we're in. And we think about, like, what it means to be intersectional. Intersectionality is not about intersecting identities. It's about intersecting systems of oppression. And those intersections show up in every room and everything I do. And to not write about them would have been dishonest. Did you change in your storytelling around your mom or your identity as you were doing the book? Not change. I think I had to search for words, right? So when I think about my mother, um, you know, I know that her absence has made me always think about what it means to be worthy, right? And I know that to be true. I had to write that, though, right? I had to sort of explain what that meant. And, and when I talk about it, I can just say one sentence and hope you fill in the rest. In the book, I have to do more than that. So, so that was hard. You can find the book at your local independent bookseller and find out more information at our website. That's lauraflanders.org or com, either one.